Hello world, welcome to The Frizzle Factor. I'm Joanne Wasden, your resident Miss Frizzle. I love cool science, cool critters, and cool classrooms. I want to foster collaboration between science and education so we can all help to increase science literacy in our communities. Join me as I interview scientists, professionals, and enthusiasts in talking about our journeys and the things we love about the world around us. So I'm not the best at introductions. That's why I kind of assigned you that job. Uh, so yeah. who are you and what do you do as far as scientific work? Yeah, so uh, my name is Sebastian Alejandro Echeverri. I'm a fifth year PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh. And I study how and why animals get each other's attention. And in my case, I work with jumping spiders and their courtship dances. Oh, okay. And yeah. we'll dig more into that in a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But what's an interest or hobby that you have that's not related to science? Yeah, I got a few. It's, it's tough to keep them going in grad school, but um, I really like board games and video games. Um, I do fencing every when I have time. Fencing? Not that often. Oh, wow. That's, that's kind of yeah. a special. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, a lot of fun. I'm horrible at it, but um, I've been doing it for... Um, I started back in 2014. What, like I, I did a little bit before that, but like I really started doing it more often while I was studying abroad in 2014, and then I picked it back up in grad school. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, on and off. And I like um, every now and then I go to like, uh, like anime conventions and stuff like that and do like cosplay, which is mm -hmm. always really fun. Uh, but it's like has been died off because it just re requires a lot of time that I don't have in graduate school. <laughs> what? You don't have time in graduate school? No, yeah, what? right? Like, <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I um, so I'm finishing my undergraduate degree currently mm -hmm. uh, after a very prolonged hiatus and then switching what I was going to do with my life into a science field. Yeah. Um, and my husband kept saying, oh, well, you can go ahead into your grad school right now if you want to. <laughs> I don't know if I'm yeah. ready for that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it, uh, it's something to give a little bit more thought, certainly more than I did. We can get into that later, but I kind of just defaulted to grad school and mm -hmm. I definitely regret how I approached it. All right. Well, uh, that's a good segue into yeah. uh, kind of retracing your steps. So I'm going to ask mm -hmm. if your path to this point was yeah. a checklist or a series of steps, then what are the points that led to here? Even if maybe you wouldn't prescribe them for someone else, how did you <laughs> become you? <laughs> how far back should I go? Like, Well, <laughs> I don't know how, I, I, I guess what's pertinent to kind of yeah telling your story as far as uh, your work and your uh, focus in science. Uh, we probably don't need to go uh, from the beginning, beginning, um, <laughs> unless yeah. there's something relevant. Some people... No, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I, so I, I guess now it's kind of strange. I'm, I'm one of those people that's been in school since pre-K, like just kind of continuously. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I went to high school, then I went to... Uh, I'm from, I grew up in New York City, um, and then I went to the University of Miami, the one in Florida. There's also one in Ohio, which, like, confused the hell out of me for That a while. is very confusing. It is. Um, the University of Miami in Florida, where I studied biology and applied physics, and then I, uh, while I was there, I did, um, I worked as a research assistant for a, a scientist who was there, and we did some really cool field work in Namibia. Oh. So I was in. I got to be in Africa for two months straight, and that was really cool. Um, and that kind of got me into scientific research. And after my undergrad was done, I started my PhD program at the University of Pittsburgh, and that was five years ago this August. So it's been I've been there for a while. All right. So you mentioned that. Uh, well, you just mentioned that y it was a little rough. It sounds like yeah. you're going straight into grad school. Yeah, yeah. What? what um, why was it? Was it just because you did it so soon after your undergrad, or was it that you didn't know what you were going to do? Um, I so one of like the the reason that I, I one of the reasons I went into grad school was just because I really love animals and nature, and I like learning about them. Okay. Um, and I didn't know really what graduate school would be like mm. as an undergraduate because you don't really get that any of that information mm. um, and I had a bit like I 
very limited research. The only research I did was field work, which was like, that was great, but field work is very different from the experience of being a graduate student mm -hmm. you know, day to day. Yeah. Um, and there was a really big culture shock and just like, I was, I thought I'd do great because, you know, I've, I've always done okay in school. Like, you know, I'm good at, I'm good at school. Um, graduate stu school, even though the name is there, is <laughs> very different from the rest of uh, our education system. Mm. And I really didn't explore as many options as I, I think I should have even when applying. Like I just kind of, I, by, I honestly ended up in a program that I'm in right now studying jumping spiders by chance. Mm -hmm. I applied to a bunch of schools and in the process of one of those, or I only applied to two schools, which is horrible idea. But because um, I was really limiting myself, I was like, oh, I, I've only ever worked with um, social behavior in, in social insects. So that's all I'm ever going to do. Or mm -hmm. so I guess I work with birds, so social animals, but that's all I was ever, that's kind of, I like pigeonholed myself. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the interview for a researcher's lab, I talked to someone else whose work was like not online at all, but they studied the jumping spiders. Um, and I ended up, the other lab like already had picked a graduate student and this lab that I talked to didn't like any of the other candidates they have, but they really liked my enthusiasm. And so they, uh, asked if they could like offer me a position and that's how I ended up studying jumping spiders. But it was a, I, I almost pure luck. I would say 99% <laughs> luck that I got here. Um, and I'm really happy that I did because I ended up just loving the animals and the research so much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's interesting. I, I, I think that's kind of interesting because I feel like I have a similar journey as far as me coming into science uh, mm -hmm. that I did not really consider my educational options when I first set out for college. Yeah. And it's just something you're, a lot of us aren't prepared for. <laughs> I feel but. like it's, um, it's something that, yeah, like you said, mm -hmm. way too many students are dealing with that problem. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, we go to school, but we only really get good at like taking tests mm -hmm. and writing term papers and things like that, which is, those aren't skills that you're using even in academia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we can talk more a little bit about the education side, but um, mm -hmm. I, I liked what we have so far. But let's go ahead and go further into uh, the science that you are doing. Um, so what, yeah. what you briefly said, what you do with spiders right now. So if you could mm -hmm. go more into detail about what your current research entails, that'd be great. Yeah. So. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess how specific, I mean, like the kind of projects that I'm working on. Um, that would be kind of interesting. Um, so you work with, I guess, courtship rituals in yeah. spiders. So what goes into a courtship ritual for a spider? Cause I imagine that not a lot of people know that spiders even have courtship rituals. It's not an animal that we think of having exactly. uh, those kinds of social norms, I guess we could say. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe illuminate some of that for us. Yeah. 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 So. Um, I study jumping spiders, which are these like really fun types of spiders because they're kind of breaking the mold of what people think spiders might be. Mm -hmm. um, so they are very small. They're like like a centimeter long at and, like big ones um, get to be maybe maybe a little more than that. Um, but they are they're visual animals just like us. So most spiders, like their main sense is like feel through their web and stuff, but these guys don't actually build a web to catch food. They run around um, and they use their eyes. They have really, really good vision okay. uh, to search their environment and look for prey. Um, and they, that means they also use vision to talk to each other. And so um, male jumping spiders will put on like these dance performances mm -hmm. for the females. And so, they will not only wave their arms around and like show off different like colorful parts of their body. Um, they're actually also singing in a lot of species um, where they vibrate parts of their body um, or they have like these little like kind of rasps on their body to make sound that the female hears. Um, and in um, one genus, the one that I study, which is the paradise spiders. So it's a genus Habronatus. They're from uh, North, Central and South America. Um, they're incredibly diverse, so there's like at least 120 species, and all these males are like super brightly colorful. Hmm. Uh, they have really elaborate dances compared to other jumping spiders, um, and we think that this diversity has evolved really recently. And so part of my work is trying to understand a bit um, about how and why um, 
they dance the way you do. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, my second question from that was trying to be like a science teacher and asking you what the yes. driving questions um, yeah. for you are through this process. And I guess that's part of it is how and why these dances help, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's like the kind of, I think that even might be a little bit more, more narrow in, but like on a broad question, um, I'm interested in attention. So why is it so important to get someone's attention when you're trying to show them something? especially if it's something that's complicated or has a lot of different uh, layers to it. Um, and that's something that like you intuitively have to deal with when you're like giving a presentation or mm -hmm. literally just like talking to a friend and you want to keep them engaged um, or you're showing someone whatever it is. Uh, well, animals have to do that too. The, the kind of researchers, including myself, think that that's shaping how they've evolved to use, uh, how to, they've evolved to communicate with each other. They've evolved ways to control each other's attention, um, and that gives us another way to understand how um, signals evolve. So instead of just like what it means, it's also what that signal is doing to the other individual to make sure that the message is getting across really clearly. Um, so for jumping spiders, um, whether or not a female is paying attention is the difference between whether she sees the male in all his colors in like a really crisp image or she sees a blurry black and white male who's you can't really make out stuff um, and that's because their eyes they have different pairs of eyes and those eyes see differently so mm -hmm. only they have kind of six really big eyes for you for vision and only the two biggest ones if you Google a picture of a jumping spider, you know which ones I'm talking about immediately. They're these big puppy dog eyes that just like take up most of their face. <laughs> Only those can see in color. But they also have four eyes on the sides of their heads called lateral eyes. And those have a really wide field of view. They can actually see behind themselves most of the time, but those eyes only see in black and white. And so if the female's looking at the male, she's using her primary eyes and those see in color. And it's like, oh, look at all, he can show off how great he is. But if she looks away, she's still aware that he's there, but it's like less impressive or like those call that all the information that would be in those colors is lost. Hmm. And so the idea is that males have had to evolve methods to get females to look at them, not just to notice them initially, but to keep paying attention so that all of his like performance is can be appreciated. Um, and this is something that humans have too. So basically every single animal with an eye has some sort of compromise in that eye's design mm -hmm. that creates the same problem. So it's very, very hard to create an eye that is both really good at color vision, really good at high resolution, so crisp picture, and really good at um, sensitivity, so picking up any kind mm -hmm. of small mm -hmm. motion. Um, and so animals have had to evolve compromises. In jumping spiders, they do it in different eyes. In humans, we do it in different parts of our eyes. So we have an area in the center of our vision called the fovea, mm -hmm. um, and that's where we see the sharpest picture. That's where the, we have the highest resolution. Um, and it's way, 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 way smaller of your field of view than you think it is. If you take your thumb out and you hold it at arm's length, the size of your thumbnail is the area that your fovea sees at any given second. Oh, wow. And so everything else in your field of view is actually you're processing it at a lower resolution, and your brain is stitching together information and saying, oh, I remember this being like that. And so you don't experience those things as blurrier because your brain is telling you, oh, well, I saw it, so... You know, it, mm -hmm. I, I know what, how sharp it should be, and it's, it's telling you different things, but if you look at the information that's going into the eye, it's really limited by where you're actually pointing that fovea, and that's why we look around at stuff. Our eyes, like, dart around and look at things, um, and we have to pick out of all the stuff that we can look at where to focus our attention. Um, and there's a lot of, like, um, like um, uh, things that we can miss out on if we don't pay attention in the right place. Yeah, that's actually yeah. that's actually really fascinating. Um, and I see the benefit and connection to it already, but I'm going to ask the question that every teacher gets, mm -hmm. uh, that they always hate getting, yes, get that it. every student asks. Yes, why does this matter? What will I use this for in my real life? Absolutely. Why is this important? 
Um, so like I said, this is baked into how you experience the world. Mm -hmm. And that means that it's baked into how other people design things for you to experience. So we do things to get each other's attention. When we're far away from someone, we wave our arms so that that motion can attract their eyes to us. Um, basically, everything in our world is designed to, for a human to experience. So like ads, movies, product labels, everything is designed with the idea that, it well, it, it, especially nowadays, they can take into account how humans process images and how we look at stuff. Mm -hmm. And things like apps on our phone are designed to capture our attention. And they use tricks that, that um, take into account how our brain and our eyes like to look at things to keep our attention because that's something that's profitable for the company. Uh, and so once you start like kind of understanding this, you're like, you're peeling back the layers of, of, you know the surface layer and seeing okay why do things actually look the way they do both in like an immediate sense of like okay someone designed this to get my attention but like uh, even on a deep revolutionary level like hmm. have you ever asked yourself why are stoplights red like hmm. why red is there there what is it about red that we use to signify pay attention right here this is important information yeah, that's a good question, and I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of theories, but understanding how your eye processes different information um, can help answer that. So the, one of the leading theories is that humans, unlike most apes, primates, can see the color red as different from green. So most mammals actually cannot tell the difference between red and green. That's like what dogs have. Mm -hmm. um, they're not black and white, but they, can, they can't tell red from green, but they can tell the difference between blue and green. Um, and at some point, humans or the ancestors of humans evolved that ability. And one, there are a couple of different reasons why it would have been beneficial. But one was one idea is that it might have helped humans spot ripening fruit against green backgrounds in trees. So when a lot of fruits ripen, they turn a reddish, orange, mm. yellowish color. And if you are better able to distinguish that from the green surroundings, you will have uh, better success, you'll have more food, and so you'll survive longer. Um, and that idea of red things are important might actually be something that is coded into our DNA. That is something that might be built into how human brains work. Hmm. Um, and part of that is, our evidence for that is the fact that we use red for things that we think are really important, like stop signs and, um, stoplights, mm -hmm. but also that when something is red, we see it as more important or more desirable. So there's a lot of studies that show that um, when humans are looking at someone of a sex that they find attractive, um, when that person is either wearing a red dress or red clothing, or they're even just next to a red background, that they find them more attractive just because of that association with the color red as something interesting wow and so it's it's all in there you don't realize it because it's very hard to distance mm -hmm. your perception of the world from the brain machine that perceives it yep um but once you you st take a step are able to take a step back the world becomes a, a lot more interesting yeah no that's cool that's really cool um it's funny um it's kind of a running joke now that i kept learning about kind of how um, we've developed different evolutionary, um, I guess, patterns and how we select mates. And sometimes mm -hmm. I'll tell my husband, I'll be like, you smell disgusting, but I know it's the pheromones. I am a total <laughs> ant in this, you know, this machine. Yeah. I'm a cog in the machine and I know it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's just another example of something that uh, <laughs> once you, you kind of have to meta recognize what's going on and you're kind of like, well, yeah. Yep. <laughs> no, it, it's the same for me. Red is my favorite color. Like, <laughs> I'm I'm not immune to this. I think that like whenever there's like a character on like a show or a comic that like has like a red, red. scarf, I'm like, whoa, that's really cool. If it was a blue scarf, it would be less cool. And like, I know that's just like my innate bias towards that color, but it's like I also think it's cool. 
so I can't, you know, I have, I, I have to accept it because that's just who I am. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, that actually, okay, this is an unrelated question. Well, not that's really okay. unrelated, that's, that's, but that's I am fun. wondering, because I guess I have to ask, if you're into spiders, do you actually like Spider-Man? Um, yeah. I'll, and I'm sure oh you get that gosh. question. I, um, okay, so I am a 27-year-old graduate student from Forest Hills, New York City, <laughs> who does photography and journalism on the side. So oh. I've gone through my life and slowly just checked off little boxes um, and just ended up in a world where I not only love spiders and love Spider-Man, but I think I am Spider-Man now. Um, I mean, it makes great. sense. I love it. It's like the best thing that's happened in my entire life. Well, did you see the uh, Into the Spider-Verse yes, movie? Exactly yeah, right. so I was going to say, yeah, that is like <laughs> so relatable. I, I, had, I had some moments in the theater when they were showing that scene and they, they, were, they were referencing him as the 27-year-old graduate student. And like, I turn to my partner who's sitting next to me and I just like, my eyes are wide and I'm just like, I want to scream right now because this is too real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, Spider-Man's been a part of my life for a while. Like they filmed the original, like the characters from where I grew up and they mm -hmm. filmed the original Sam Raimi movies mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. Like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Like, I recognize scenes. Like, oh, that's, I know that first restore. Like, you know. You, that you kind lived of it. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I just like nowadays, I, I love, the, especially the Tom Holland movies and Spider-Verse mm -hmm. have been like, I just love them. I think they're doing great things with the character um, and the universe. And I'm also really excited to use that to like get people excited about spiders. So yes. like, I just published a story. Um, we could talk about like what I'm doing now because I'm working as a science journalist this summer. Mm -hmm. I just published a story about the science of Spider-Man and what, how he matches up to real life spiders that might have inspired his powers. Oh, that's great. Um, and like, that was like the most fun thing I've ever gotten to write. That's great. Yeah. yeah. We can uh, get more into that when we kind of delve into some of the more science communication stuff that you're doing. Yeah, Cause yeah, I know yeah. you're doing a lot. Uh, you've been helping me. So it's great. Um, so to kind of summarize, well, maybe not a summary, but if you could pick one thing that you unexpectedly discovered along the way about, uh, particularly like the science, it could be somewhere in your elementary school days, it could be in high school, it could be in college or mm -hmm. post undergrad, uh, graduate school. Um, what was something that uh, was unexpected that you discovered along yeah. the way? Um, I think the, the thing that like has changed my life the most is the realization that my favorite part about science mm -hmm. is sharing it with other people. Hmm. So that was not something that I like really knew even going into graduate school. Um, you know, I thought I'd just go in a lab and do research and stuff, but like I have enjoyed a lot of the research I've done, but I've been the happiest when I'm doing things like this podcast or uh, doing an outreach event with my spiders or things like that. Those mm -hmm. are like, that's what gives me strength. That's awesome. Yeah. And then kind of dovetailing off of that, what's something unexpected you discovered about yourself along the way? Oh, sorry. That, I didn't realize that. I, that's what I thought. That oh, well, was. Those, I mean, they kind of go together, <laughs> I guess. It is kind of hard, I guess, to yeah, no, I, separate I them. Um, I, when I was not looking at the right part of the list. So yeah, the <laughs> most unexpected thing about myself is realizing that I, that my favorite part of science is sharing it with others. Mm -hmm. The most interesting thing about science and like what I study, mm -hmm. um, like basically everything about spiders, like every time I, I like learn anything about spiders, it's just like, <laughs> what, what, how? Um, because I didn't really know much about them literally until I was in the interview for the lab that I would join. Oh, wow. Um, so like, I didn't know anything about the, like they're, but they are such a, a diverse group of animals. Um, there's over 50,000 species of spiders wow. uh, that we know of. And there's even more that are estimated to be out there. So they are more spiders than like birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians combined. Mm. Um, and inside all of that, there's so many weird different takes on like how to be a spider. Um, I could spend far too long talking about them. Yeah, it's just, it, they, they're they super weird. Um, some of the like techniques that I ended up using, to, like the fact that, okay, so there is a machine, there's actually several, which is even crazier, um, that is a spider eye tracker. Okay. I'm about to use it. It's literally a machine that like you put a spider in it 
and you play the spider a video, and it will tell you where the spider is looking inside of that video. What? <laughs> yeah. That is wild. And it is like held together with like sheer willpower and cardboard and like duct tape in like the basement of like a lab at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And it is the coolest thing ever. Um, it was actually in the, there was a New York Times article about it like a couple months ago. Um, it's super cool. And like the fact that that exists and like the idea for it has existed since like the 1960s. <laughs> Um, oh, who yeah, thought no, of this? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Exactly. Like, I was just like, what? Like, we can do, we can write it. We can say we're going to do this in a grant. Like, people, like, that's a real thing. Yeah, okay, sure. Let's go do see, it. I, I can see, like, yeah, the clickbait was... headlines of, like, which, uh, which um, you know, Spider-Man movie does this spider prefer, oh, right? <laughs> you have no idea how tempted I was to just play random ass things to this spider <laughs> and just see, like, what it liked. We ran out of, because we were like, we were only there for a limited amount of time mm-hmm. when I got to use it. So we didn't have that luxury because there was like, it took a long time to get the spider in it. And like, we didn't have that much time to like actually use the machine. But oh my gosh, I really wanted to play it. I the, Okay, the one that I did do, that's my favorite, mm-hmm. is that I played it. It's own, a video of its own eyes looking at a video. So it was a spider... <laughs> Watching a spider, watching a, watching spider. a video of a spider. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so it was it was watching what it did when it watched the video that it just watched. Wow. Um, and I feel I like I don't I don't know what the spider like got out of that, but the, yeah, we were we were very tempted. <laughs> wow, that's great. Oh man, I want one of those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so do I. They, I, I. I have a lot of ideas for like really dumb memes that I could make with that. Yes. If I had more access to it, I yes. would. Uh, all right, we should yeah get a get a grant on that and just <laughs> make that a more common lab equipment. Oh gosh, I wish, yeah. Um, so you sort of mentioned that it was kind of out of luck that you ended up in the lab that you ended up mm-hmm. in. Um, so what actually did kind of draw you towards this. I asked what drew you toward arachnids, but did mm-hmm. you actually just fall into it by accident? Or did you oh, think, oh, yeah. well, that could be kind of cool, and then just applied? Nope. <laughs> I, uh, the closest I got was I applied to work with a research that, like a completely different lab, I never ended up even meeting the person that worked with social spiders, so spiders that live together and kind of work together. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the process of that, one of the other researchers, so when you interview for grad school, you interview with the person who you're applying to and then like other people in the department just to like, you know, get a, a sense of like who you are as a candidate. Um, and in that interview, they like tell you about like, oh, this is the stuff that I have going on. And in those inter- in that interview, I literally just saw um, like a video of a jumping spider for the first time, like a macro video. So like really, you know, actually like magnified in so you get to see it mm-hmm. just like dancing. <laughs> like up close and I'm just like what what like that that's that's real like that's a real animal it's doing this <laughs> okay I'm in like I I literally had a reaction in the thing in the meeting where I like stood up and I'm just like what this is crazy <laughs> um and there was that video and then there was a second one that showed how their eyes move inside of their head because sometimes when they're young they're transparent you can actually see their eyes moving inside of their head oh wow it blew me away um and that's that's honestly the reason <laughs> that <laughs> those great. videos and that interview is the reason that I'm now in a now a spider scientist. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I think that's um I think it goes against I think sometimes science teachers kind of make it seem like you have to ha- be have that curiosity of the outside world from the time you were in second grade mm-hmm. or else you're never going to be a scientist but sometimes some of us just accidentally yeah. end up <laughs> where we are in the end. That's There's funny. a lot of happy coincidences, I think, in a lot of people's science careers. Like, I, yeah, I was, I liked animals growing up, but, like, I went through so many, dis, like, idea, I, there was, okay, I originally was like, oh, I'm going to be a vet, and then I volunteered in a vet clinic, and I'm like, I am not going to be a vet. <laughs> then I thought I was going to be an architect, and that's what I applied to my undergraduate institutions based on that idea. One semester in, no, I'm not going to be an architect anymore. I almost switched to engineering at the end of my undergraduate degree. Um, and then I just, the only, re- the only reason I didn't was because I didn't have enough, 
credit, so I would have, would have had to take an extra semester past the end of my scholarship, and like, mm-hmm. that was out of the question. <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah, you kind of stumble through life, and like, on one hand, I think that if that's the experience you're having, that's totally normal, that's okay, you're going to find somewhere and end up somewhere good. And on the other hand, if you were interested in these things, ask, like use social media and ask around because like I, I definitely didn't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the, there are resources on the internet for like people in those, like, you know, people who are curious about academia to like learn more and I just didn't use them. Mm. Yeah. Um, so uh, next question. What yeah. are some common misconceptions that you come across regarding spiders or invertebrates in general? Okay, like, and I bet there's a lot. How much time do we have? I know. I mean, it's kind of the one that everyone's afraid of, but I mean, what? Give us a few that you think you could okay. maybe dispel for us. I will be really quick. Um, I'll go like go go through the big ones. Um, one, the very basic one is, what does a spider look like? And even if you look at like logos on Spider-Man's suit, um, many of the designers do not know. Um, <laughs> a spider has two big parts of their body they have a head mm-hmm. and they have the abdomen mm-hmm. and they have eight legs and those legs are attached only to their head oh. no legs are attached to the abdomen only the spinnerets are attached to the abdomen um and they also have two fangs and then they have two they're kind of like arms they're called petty palps and they use them to hold pick up stuff and they also use them as the intermittent or male males use them to transfer sperm during mating um so they actually have 10 limbs, not just eight. Um, and that's what a spider looks like. So many cartoons show spiders either one ball, and that's a different type of arachnid. <laughs> yeah. That is a harvest man or a, a daddy long legs, which is not a spider. Um, uh-huh. Or they have legs attached to just the abdomen or both, and like that is also wrong. Um, sometimes they draw them as three body segments. There's this idea that spiders are a type of bug, um, which bug is like a really loose term, but the, the most... Um, I guess like definitive sense of it is any sort of insect could be a bug Mm -hmm. Um, and spiders are actually separated by it from insects by like at least 380 million years of evolution if not more so insects are actually a type of crustacean Mm -hmm. that evolved to move on to land so insects and crustaceans and things like uh, centipedes are all more related to each other than any of them are related to arachnids like spiders and scorpions. Um, the other thing that I mentioned is just like what like what do spiders do? There are spiders that make webs. There are spiders that don't make any webs except like to sleep in. Um, there there's a ton of diversity in them. So like there are spiders doing a bunch of like super weird cool things that I don't have time to get into. But there's fifty thousand of them, and they've yeah. all figured out a unique way of being a spider um the only thing that is i guess common amongst them is that they use silk um because there are some spiders that have lost the ability to make venom so they don't use venom but silk is the thing that really unites them as a group Hmm. um spiders for the the uh, 99 point god what is it it's like 99 or 95 percent of all spiders um in the united states are not harmful to humans That means that on the incredibly rare chance that you get bit, um, you don't need to go to a doctor. It's just like any sort of other insect bite where, like, there's a bump and some swelling that goes away in a few weeks, and then you forget about it for the rest of your life. Mm. Uh, A lot of the photos that you see online and, like, media sites are of two things. One, um, misdiagnoses. So, actually, no one really knows what a spider bite looks like. Doctors are not at all trained how to ID them. You basically have to catch the spider biting you to know that it was a spider bite. And two, infections. Mm. So anytime something pierces your skin, yes. uh, you can get infected. And a lot of times this happens in like, uh, if you don't clean that thing right away, in, in, yes, in spider bites as well as literally anything else, um, you can develop these really gross infections that are what you get when people, or like when you Google like spider bite. Um, mm. The only two spiders in the United States that have venom that requires a doctor's visit are the black widow and the brown recluse. Those have really well-documented limited ranges. So there are areas where there aren't any brown recluses. There are areas where there aren't any black widows. Um, And 
both of those are not life-threatening if you go to see a doctor within 24 hours. And even if you don't, the vast majority of bites that are not seen to also don't um, cause life-threatening issues. Hmm. So they are honestly like really shy, scared animals to a spider. Um, you are a skyscraper that has come to life. Um, and that is like walking around near mm -hmm. them. And they have venom. So all spiders have venom or the vast majority of spiders have venom, which they use to catch their food. Um, but that venom has evolved to kill the things that they eat. So that's usually like little crickets or other spiders their size. Um, it doesn't work on humans because their bodies work a different way, a different way. We're much bigger. And the spiders know this. It's like if you were downtown and the Empire State Building just started walking around and picked you up, you have a handgun. <laughs> you can shoot the building, but it might be a better idea to run away. Mm -hmm. And spiders know this. Their first response is to just get out of your way if they're aware that you're there. Mm. Um, th and give them enough credit for that. I think there's a lot of myths of like, oh, spiders will climb into your mouth. Spiders will yeah. they, they, they know enough to stay away from other animals. They don't want to get eaten. Yeah. Yeah, it is it's funny. I, um, I've come to really like spiders very recently. Yeah. And um, my mom's going to visit my house. My, my, I, I moved into my house two years ago. My mom still hasn't visited my new house yet. She lives in another state. And she's going to freak out because I let the spiders coexist with me. Yes. <laughs> and, and like, my, my husband, um, he, he gives me, or, like, he's always calling me whenever there's, like, a wolf spider in the house. I have a yeah. wolf spider cup that I use to, like, grab Aww. them and, like, yeah. get them outside. And I know my mom's going to come and freak out because there's gonna be spiders at every turn <laughs> but i just i don't know they're so nice and they actually do a lot of pest control and it's surprising yeah. to me that a lot of people don't realize that yeah they're they're a really important part of our ecosystem both inside and outside the house so like in your house they are eating all the things that like actually can cause damage to your your stuff so mm -hmm. like beetle larvae moth larvae cockroaches they love to eat cockroaches crickets anything that'll like you really don't want to get into your, your food or your clothes. Spiders are like, they, they really want to eat that. So they want to help you out um, if you let them. And mm -hmm. outside, they are not only like important predators, but they're also a really important food source for a lot of animals like birds. Mm. Yeah. So oh, how do you... The other thing, oh, yeah. one, one more thing, if I just... Yes. We can cut this later, but no, no. I, I always have to say it. Spiders are venomous. They are not poisonous. If you eat a spider... <laughs> you will not get sick. You will not die. Men, there are cultures around the world where they collect tarantulas and cook them up and eat them. Mm -hmm. If you get bitten by a spider, it will inject venom into you and it'll cause swelling. Um, and that's the difference. Poisonous, something that if you eat it, you get sick. And venomous, if it bites you, you get sick. Mm. Uh, spiders are one, but not the other. I see even scientific papers get this wrong, but there is a like really important difference and it tells you a lot about whether or not you can pick up the animal. I can pick up spiders, pick up many spiders that I've never gotten any sort of skin reaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, no, that's good, that's good. Um, I follow a lot of uh, uh, herpetologists also on Twitter. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like the big thing, like the snakes <laughs> aren't poisonous. Gotta have, yeah, to exactly. have that on a shirt or something, just to let people know. <laughs> But um, so then how do you think that science communicators and educators can help to alleviate some of these misconceptions, like maybe in how we teach it or how we approach the subject, how we introduce yep. these animals, etc.? cetera? Um, I think there's a lot of really easy steps that people can take. The first would be to uh, avoid any sort of negative framing. So that's when we use words to describe the animal mm -hmm. um, that have a negative connotation. So things like if I showed you a spider and I like, look at this terrifying animal, even if the rest of my message is about how it has cool adaptations or anything like that, that might get overshadowed by describing it initially as something to be scared of. Hmm. Um, and our society is doing this constantly. So like everywhere in movies, TV shows, media, you're seeing that already. Like, people are getting that message that bugs are something to be hated mm -hmm. and despised. And so when it comes from another source, like a science source or um, a museum, that, re that only reinforces it. So the, what message you're going for is going to get weakened down. Um, so, and that's really easy. You can just change your words. So you can use words that are neutral or positive. Like you can say it's cool. You can say it's weird. You can say it's fascinating. Um, and that lets people, if they still, if they 
make these aesthetic decisions on like whether or not they think it looks nice or ugly for themselves without you telling them what the right choice is. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is if you're drawing a spider, just Google spider anatomy, draw a real <laughs> spider. So people know when they're looking for one, what, what it looks like. Um, it's a, it's an easy thing to do. Um, that can really make a difference of just putting out positive reinforcement of that fact out there. Um, if you do any sort of outreach or you're a parent or a teacher, um, let people meet these animals in a safe and comfortable way. So a lot of the times the way that people are introduced to spiders, um, or at least that they remember that is they are in their basement late at night and the lights are like flickering on and off and they see something scurry across the floor. Mm. And like, that's just a harmless wolf spider. It's trying to eat like the roaches in your basement. Um, but that situation is startling and it's really easy to go from being startled by something to being very afraid of the idea of something. But if you meet a spider, um, in a, a you know, in a well-lit area where it's safely contained in a nice cage and you can look at it up close without any fear of it going to run up your arm or things like that. Um, I find that that is really helpful. People who are even initially afraid will come in and they, they'll see the, the spider and the spider's just sitting there and they can observe it and learn about it and have a positive experience. And I think like building up this like list of positive experiences is really helpful. So any time that you, any chance that you have to present the animal in that way, and mm. this goes for like all sorts of invertebrates and bugs and anything that people like think is negative, mm -hmm. um, have that and, and like let people take it at their own pace. If they're like, uh, sometimes I warm people up with like a photo of a spider and then a toy of a spider and then like an exoskeleton to the spider shed and then mm. here's the real spider. That's and a good like idea. letting people take it at their own pace, let them ask questions, let them be comfortable um, seems to work really well for me. That's actually really excellent advice. I think that would be really helpful for science teachers, especially. Um, mm -hmm. I know I'm going to be trying to uh, hard hit the invertebrates this semester, yes. so we'll see yes. how that goes, and I hope it goes well. Yeah, I think I think there's and there's there's so many of them that you can do a lot of really mm -hmm. cool stuff with them. Like just in your backyard, you can have dozens of species of invertebrates um, that are all really weird. They're all doing really different things. They've all evolved for different reasons. Um, and you can learn a lot about them, which is a lot harder to do if you're just looking at bigger animals like mammals. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so speaking of misconceptions, then mm -hmm. we're going to go broader. So what is yeah, a mi yeah. misconception? We've talked a little bit. We've kind of alluded already in the conversation about uh, some misconceptions that you had. Um, so what is a misconception about being a scientist or the scientific method or process that you would like to challenge? Oh, <laughs> Oh, uh, again, how much time do we have? Um, I think I think there's one that a lot of people are talking about that I just want to reiterate. Mm -hmm. Scientists are not just old white men. Mm -hmm. Scientists are people from all different backgrounds, different skin colors, different life experiences, different genders. Anyone can be a scientist. Mm -hmm. And there is an issue of representation of scientists in the media. But there are scientists from all different backgrounds. And if you look, you'll find them. Um, so that one's huge. That's like a big thing for me. Um, but in terms of the scientific method, um, I think that the way we are taught that and the way mm -hmm. that I learned it is very, very, very different from what we actually do, like oh, yeah. what scientists actually do when we're in, quote unquote, the lab. The lab can be anywhere. Um, so there's this idea that like that is kind of drilled into you in a science fair project. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, uh, my I have my question. Um, like, does this do these Skittles taste different based on what color they are? My one of my hypotheses is yes, they do, and the other is no, they don't. And then <laughs> I do an experiment, which is my taste test. Um, and that formulation of like thinking about something. Um, is honestly what scientists are trying to avoid. So what, what I just did there is that I narrowed my options um, and I didn't even actually come up with a real hypothesis. I came up with predictions. So I predicted two things that might have happened. Um, so this is, uh, I'm going to do my best to explain this because it is tricky. Mm -hmm. But basically when you have a question about science, 
you really want to ask it in, well, you can ask it about in, in a yes or no way, but it's a lot easier to ask how or why is something happening. Mm -hmm. So why is there a difference in how different colors of Skittles taste? Um, if, or how do different colors of Skittles taste? Do they taste differently? And your hypothesis is your idea um, about why that thing, why something might be happening. So in this case, it would be, okay, I think that um, my hypothesis could be that the different colored Skittles use different flavors. I mean, this is really basic because mm -hmm. um, we know that that's true. They use different uh, flavors that correspond to the chemicals, the, the, the colors used. Um, and so that would be something that you could, that, that's an idea that explains why you might be seeing what you do, which is like, oh, some skills taste different than others. And then you do an experiment, but before you do that, you, or you, you come up with an idea to, to, to test your hypothesis, which is, all right, I'm going to taste different Skittles and like a bunch of people are going to do it and we'll see what, what happens. Um, and then you come up with a prediction. So if my idea is true, then I think I will see this when I look at, when I do my experiment. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the goal of like the planning step is that you actually want to come up with different possible explanations mm -hmm. because things could be, you could see the same result for different explanations. Yes. And you want to keep in mind all the, the as, as much as you can, all the possibilities so that when you are looking at uh, what you find, you can try to keep an open mind mm -hmm. um, and and not just be limited to the first thing that you think of. Because like we talked about earlier, our brain has evolved in a way and our culture has taught us in a way that makes us incredibly biased. It makes us more likely to make certain choices over others. Um, and ideally when we are doing science we are trying to overcome that by being really um uh open in our thinking mm -hmm. not limiting ourselves to the first most likely seeming thing yes yeah that, and that is yeah sorry no continue no 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 you, you keep going i'm, I'm, I'm more or less <laughs> all right I'm, I'm at the point where i can begin to ramble forever <laughs> so stop it. that's all right no i was just gonna uh, affirm that because uh, that is certainly something that i've experienced too for me i um, you know, you always hear those statistics about, you know, if you don't get young girls by age five or age eight or middle school, you've lost them yeah. to science forever. And I probably would have been that case. I didn't even set out uh, to do a science degree of any sort. Uh, and I really paid for it in the classes that I had to do in my adult years <laughs> that I didn't do what I should have in high school. Um, yeah. But... Um, uh, one of the things that was a big misconception for me was that kind of process that like you had to kind of go through all these steps and I just never got that. And I realized yeah. uh, right now I'm in ecology and doing mostly camera trap stuff. Yeah. So oh, you just, really you cool. literally just go outside, put a camera, see what you find, and then you start doing the rest, right? Then you start mm -hmm. thinking of why, then you start thinking of hypotheses. Like you literally do the experiment before you do everything else in some senses. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, you have so to, you so. always want to base like your, you need something to base your, your hypotheses, your possible explanations yes. on. And yes. So you, have, you need to observe stuff. You need to go out and like, have a baseline idea of what is going on yes. around the stuff you're interested in. Exactly. Otherwise, you're just yeah. kind of coming up with a statement that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I totally agree. Um, so I'm going to dovetail. You You talked a little bit about uh, the, your first misconception was that, you know, people kind of have a certain idea of mm -hmm. what scientists are. And I was definitely one of those people that had yeah. an idea of this, you know, science people, right? I'm like, yeah. the reason why I didn't go into science, because oh, I'm not a math person. I'm not a science yeah. person, yeah. you know, no. yeah. I hate yeah. math. <laughs> and yeah, and it was actually, um, and I, you know, I, I went into university doing, I mean, I, I switched my major like a bajillion times, mm -hmm. but it was a lot of like Same communication, thing. English type things, because I'm not a math person. So we're not going to go there. And, and science for me, at least in high school, um, and I'm not saying this to if there's any teachers that I had listening, <laughs> I'm not saying this to like denigrate their efforts. Um, but for me, I felt like science was very much um, like you sit in a lab and you do stuff. You know, or, or it's like the kids that know a lot of math or it's the kids that know a lot of physics. And I was never really mm -hmm. much into chemistry, physics. There was a very there wasn't a lot of ecology based yeah. uh, natural yeah, science uh, for me yeah. in, in high school. Um, so I didn't do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, 
quit college, had a couple years where I wasn't really doing anything. I started volunteering at a nature center, which where I got to experience right. safe experiences with reptiles for the first time, which was mm-hmm. the cool thing for me. I was like, I never knew I loved reptiles. <laughs> and, you know, my mom was yeah, freaking out. Like, really cool. yeah, I can't I believe really you're touching things. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. They're so cute. But I, I would have many family members who would not visit me if I had a pet mm-hmm. snake. <laughs> I, I settled for a tortoise instead. It's a totally Aww, neutral animal. Adorable. He's adorable. Um, But there was a book that really changed my life because Mm -hmm. it's the book that propelled me to actually go to school because it challenged my perceptions of what a scientist and who a scientist could be. And that is E.O. Wilson's book, Letters to a Young Scientist. Oh, cool. I don't know. Are are you familiar with that book? I'm familiar with E.O. Wilson, but not the book. Yes. So E.O. Wilson, for those who don't know, um, he's a very prominent etymologist and educator who's done a lot of work. his thing is ants, so that's always yep. it's kind of cool. I actually um, got to meet him when I interviewed at another university. Oh, really? Oh, that's amazing. Which was like, it was, like I wasn't expecting to, so mm-hmm. I wasn't prepared to meet E.O. Wilson. Oh. <laughs> and I don't think I left a great impression on oh, him. Oh, no. <laughs> but hopefully he forgives me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he does. <laughs> He's listening to this right now going, oh, I remember that kid. Yeah. He was great. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I didn't end up going to school, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so his book, Letters to a Young Scientist, I really like it because it's kind of, I recommend it to whenever teachers ask for recommendations, I always recommend it to them because he kind of does it in like a memoir slash, um, you know, advice kind of thing. So yeah. he kind of tells a little bit of his story, but then also kind of just makes you want to conquer the world because he like inspires you to be more yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, but he has these principles that he puts in the book that I kind of boil down and it's going, it's going, this is, this is a long prelude into my next question. Um, but he has these different principles that kind of dispel, I guess, some of these ideas that we have as young people thinking about what a scientist is like. Um, So one of them, or two of them, really cover that, uh, one, you don't really need math. (laughs) I mean, you do, but like, the degree, like, there's always someone to help you. So his first principle is that it's far easier for scientists um, to collaborate than it is to have to do it all yourself. Yeah. So there's that mm-hmm. idea that whether it's math or something else, a different area that you're not familiar um, with, statistics. that you could, uh-huh. yeah, I know. Oh man, I, I was, a side note, I was not prepared um, to do statistics at all. I never took a no, statistics class in high no. school. I, I, I got away with like not even taking a math my senior year of high school. And then oh, wow. by the time I returned to college, I had been like, what, like, four years out of high school or something and so I was really underprepared to do my math (laughs) classes and when I had to do stats for my undergraduate research I had I have well I still have um, an amazing mentor um, but there were a few times where I almost cried because I'm like Mm -hmm. I don't know as much as you think I know (laughs) but you know that's one of the things that I learned um, that I have people to depend on yeah um, and that there's there's different areas and this is principle number two that eo wilson has is that there Mm -hmm. for every scientist whether researcher technician teacher manager or businessman working at any level of mathematical competence there exists a discipline in science or medicine for which that level is enough to achieve excellence and i love that because that was definitely one of my experiences um and 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 i think that there's there's this idea um that, that kind of builds on that is that like you in in not just for math like the you know when you're mm-hmm. a, a high school and undergrad you know you have to know all you have to do calculus you have to know everything you have to do ground all mm-hmm. tests um and it's the same thing for biology it's like you're expected to to just learn and memorize and everything have this full bank of all of the biology of the world in <laughs> yes your head. um and as this as in as a graduate student um and I say this categorically with full confidence. Literally everyone Googles literally everything. <laughs> yes. Unless it's like within your specific field of research, mm-hmm. all the other information you have is just like, yeah, I have a vague understanding. And then mm-hmm. if you need anything specific, you look it up. Yes. Because it's un- it's it's a waste of brain space to be a dictionary when a dictionary is literally like 15 seconds away from you at any point in your life. Yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So, so that goes into my next question. Do you have like a specific instance instance where there was something that you were daunted by at first, whether that's a skill or a subject or a task yeah. or an expectation that you were either able to overcome or develop or learn to lead on someone else? So there's a lot of okay. ways you could take that. Yes. Okay. So I have um, I have two. Um, I think one. I guess the, the biggest one for me, I think within graduate school Mm -hmm. is just writing so Mm. writing anything for me is like this really stressful like anxiety inducing nightmare process (laughs) where I stare at a page and I try to make the perfect sentence appear and when it's not perfect I immediately backspace and try to remake it perfectly and that has been incredibly self-destructive and very hard it made it really really hard for me to be a productive scientist because like you do actually do do a decent amount of writing at at a certain point in your science career you're writing grants and then you're writing papers um, and now I'm writing science journalism Um, and I have slowly improved on that it's been a a long process and it is ongoing but Mm. recognizing that that no one writes everything perfectly the first time that's not that's madness um and finding ways to get around that. So finding the times of day where you feel comfortable writing or where you, where you are more productive, I guess, less distracted. Like I, I often like block basically everything except like the Google Docs that I'm working on and like shut off the notification on my phone because otherwise I will look at other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and the I think one of the things that really helped me is this idea that you should don't say don't set your writing goals to be like, I'm gonna write this paper today. To, Say, I'm going to write productively for an hour and see how I feel. Hmm. Because when I have this, like, you are going to write the paper today, Sebastian, that's a sword hanging over my head, <sighs> and I, I freak out. Um, but if I'm trying, just trying to write for time, I find that I often write, the, I make my goal or I go past it. Or maybe I'm at the hour and I'm like, oh, I actually have a lot of ideas. I'm going to keep going. Um, and it can be like, I started this writing, I'm going to say, I sat down in the morning, I needed to write a paper, I'd been working on it for months, literally months, hmm. and I was freaking out. And I was like, okay, I'm going to write for, this is something like my therapist recommended, uh, write for 10 minutes, set an alarm for 10 minutes, write for 10 minutes, see how you feel. And I'm like, 10 minutes, I could do anything for 10, like 10 minutes isn't bad, I mm-hmm, can do anything for mm-hmm. 10 minutes. And I wrote 10 minutes, and I was like, huh, I didn't write too much, but like, I have some ideas, I'll write for 10 minutes, 10 more minutes, I'll write for 10 more minutes. I just kept doing that, and like I'd end up writing for like 30 or 40 minutes, which is not a huge amount of time, but it is 30 or 40 minutes that I more than I would have written if I was trying to, if I was really focusing on like getting everything perfect. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah. So that that's been the biggest challenge within graduate school. Um, I have experiences on the road to graduate school that I think <laughs> would fit more. A, a, there was a one of your questions about the a negative science experience mm-hmm. that I think. Um, I don't know if you want to do it now, but I, th- I have a story that I tell all of the students that I teach after their first exam. Um, I don't know if you want to do it now or later, but... Sure, we can do it now. Let's do it now. Okay. Editing is a magical tool. Yeah. Um, so you can slot this in whenever. <laughs> um, I'll leave a blank space. Oh, it's fine. I'm very flexible, <laughs> so it just gonna, it's going to go naturally okay. with our... Yeah, I'm, just, I'm honest. I'm like half goofing. Um, so basically... <laughs> Everyone, like for you, it sounds like math was a big challenge. Mm-hmm. I did okay with math. I did okay. I actually really love physics. That was fun. Chemistry. Mm. Chemistry is a challenge for Sebastian. Ooh. Um, <laughs> yeah. And especially in undergraduate <laughs> biology majors, you have to take organic chemistry. Oh, I know. I... Which, which, like, chemistry is like, it's okay. You can, like, I can, like, I kind of goofed through chemistry. I was okay. I was fine. Organic chemistry. Um, yes. Made zero sense. And there was a point where um, I got what I think might be the lowest exam score ever received by anyone that I'm aware of. So I'm going to let you guess. What do you think the lowest grade that I have ever gotten on an exam? Me, a fifth-year PhD student uh, who's been published in journals, (laughs) um, attends conferences, talks to hundreds of scientists. What do you think the lowest grade I ever got on an exam was? I don't know. I, I always go really uh, high, or I really go really intense numbers. So I'm just gonna guess that you got like a D or an F. <laughs> uh, that that would be in most 
so an F, a D is like a 65, and an S is anything below a 65. So it is uh, technically an F, but try to guess out of Oh, 100. the percentage? Oh my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, see, well, this was this is a hard this is a hard one for me too. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Let's go with thirty percent somewhere oh, there. I wish a thirty. Would oh, have been awesome! Thirty would have been so good. I would have been really proud if I got a thirty. Oh wow, ten. Oh, oh my. five. Did you answer like two questions? <laughs> I answered three questions correctly, and the score on my report oh, wow. was negative seven. Negative, negative. Okay, yeah, that actually wins. I didn't even know that was possible. How yeah, is that possible? No, neither did I until one morning when I walked up to the board where the exams were posted and I looked at my student ID number and it said negative seven. What? And and I took several moments of, of, of processing. I checked again because that's a nonsense number. I know I know how numbers and percentages work. You can't get a negative. Yes. I received the score of negative seven oh, wow. on an organic chemistry exam, the one that I studied the most for wow. this semester. Wow. Um, so what happened? Because there, there is a, there is, a, there is a reason. Um, I had an organic chemistry teacher that was notoriously the easy teacher. Um, like you could kind of memorize your way through his tests, and I was like, oh, I'll take him because I don't need organic chemistry. Like I don't want to do anything with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I took that course. There was another organic chemistry teacher in the department who was the, the, like, the one that you took if you either hated yourself or, like, wanted to do organic chemistry. <laughs> and her exam, her class was so hard that she had been reprimanded for multiple years for, for failing over 50% of her students. Oh, wow. Oh. Yes. Uh, not fired. Daunting. Just, like, told yeah, her, yeah. don't do it. Um, and so for, the, for a while, the system was safe. But my year, the, profess the, the hard professor was upset the people were taking the easy professor and so she lobbied the, the, the department and they allowed her to write his exam questions um they were so multiple choice but oh. they were written by the other professor and the easy professor just doesn't really teach very well um, oh wow one of the reasons it's easy and so i walked in very blindsided um there it was a 20 question exam and oh, that's, it was five ooh, that's, options that's multiple they were all multiple choice Five options, um, and I scored the score of three out of twenty. Oh wow! Uh, for anyone doing the math at home, that is below chance. So the theoretical monkey randomly hitting buttons <laughs> would have scored higher than I did. <laughs> oh <studying> man! <laughs> like multiple hours for weeks. Oh wow! Um, in preparation for this exam. And the professor was not very good at curving, uh, because almost everyone got like horrendous on that test. Mm -hmm. And A was actually a 10 out of 20, correct? And then he just took an A starting there and just went down and did something really weird with how he shifted the grades so that a zero was a random chance. So you randomly had a chance of taking the test, you would have gotten the zero. Oh, um, wow, that is yes. brutal. And if you scored below chance, <laughs> then you get negative. Then you oh, get a wow. negative score. So if I had walked in and not done anything, if I had just slept in, if I had just torn up the exam and moonwalked out of there, I would have gotten a higher score because I would have just gotten a flat zero. Wow. But I tried and I got an eighty seven. Um but I made it. I passed the class with like a C minus and then I never thought about it again because that's not something that I was interested in for my career and now I'm a graduate student and like now I teach so like everyone has a thing that they're bad at and yes. like it's gonna come up at some point but like it doesn't sink you no I, I love it it speaks to my soul so much <laughs> yeah I am um, I I did not take a chemistry class in high school I did not take a lot of things that I should have in high school with my current career trajectory but um <laughs> my and... high school chemistry class was <laughs> The only thing I remember is that the teacher just liked to light things on fire, which was oh. <laughs> fun, but I didn't really learn, learn anything. anything. <laughs> yeah. We just lit things on fire and occasionally, like in chem lab, like vials exploded and I had glass in my arm. And I'm oh, like, no. all right, I did the lab report, whatever. <sighs> but yeah, it's not my thing. Yeah, no, yeah. So I didn't even do that. And then undergraduate, <laughs> yeah, chemistry was rough. And I actually last semester finished uh, biochemistry which is required for our Ooh. program, for our biology yeah. program. And 
I thought it would be easier because it's biochemistry, so no, it would be more bio conceptually bio. biology. Yeah, no, it it was it was worse than organic for yeah. me, <laughs> and I didn't I, even. Oh, that I was knew someone who took biochemistry in undergrads, and I like saw some of what they did, and wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a whole other beast. It's weird because I appreciate it afterwards. Like, I think part of it was mm -hmm. just, it was just a lot of negative framing in that class in the way that it was yeah. taught, in the way that everyone approached it. And afterwards, I'm like, oh, I could, that could be nice to integrate into my own class one day. I like it yeah, now. You learn cool stuff. It's just, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. 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 Um, oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> it just, it just all, all of that from the writing also, I'm currently working on a paper right now that I have to mm -hmm. finish one day. <laughs> one day. And yeah, you're, it just, everything you said, it just speaks to my soul. <laughs> um, so you do a lot of science communication, so we're going to start kind yeah. of going into some of that. So what is the role of science communication in your life and um, what are some of the things that you're doing right now to participate in science communication? Um, so I've got a bunch of things going on mm -hmm. right now. I'll start chronologically, I guess. So like what I'm doing at the moment is I am working as a science journalist at the Philadelphia Inquirer. So that is okay. my full-time job for the summer. Um, I'm here through a fellowship um, that's run by the AAAS, so the American Association for the Advancement of Science. May have switched some A's around in there. Mm -hmm. I never get it right. Um, but there's been a lot of stuff that I've done that has like led up to this. So I do a lot of stuff. I'm like really active, active on Twitter. Um, so I not only tweet just like general spider stuff and like stuff that I'm doing, but the big thing that I, I think is really fun for me, and I think is something that basically any scientist can get into because the bar to entry is like literally none, is when I go to a conference and I sit down to a talk, um, I live tweet it. So oh. I, I listen, talk, and I do a summary for a in like public audience, um, you know, avoiding jargon, getting the big points or like interesting facts. And like the last three or four conferences that I've been to, I've live tweeted the majority of talks that I've gone to. There are days where I'm like really exhausted or like if I'm giving a talk, I can't focus on the Lizzie before. But um, that has been a really, really fun experience. And the feedback has been wonderful because there's scientists. Obviously, if you go to a con any scientific conference, mm -hmm. scientists out there, Y'all know this. You can't go to everything. Like, there's no way they're concurrent. Yeah. So people within the conference are like, oh, wow, thank you for telling me about like, who's doing this and what they're doing because like, I didn't get a chance to go. And then people, just like random other people that I know were in different fields are like, oh, that's such a, such a cool thing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and it opens up what used to be this like, kind of like closed, you know, closed door mm -hmm. of academia, just like side to side to side this to something that like public, the public can access. Like anyone can follow me on Twitter. It's very easy. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I like to do is outreach events and like with people in person. So I've done a lot of events at local museums, uh, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History okay. and the um, Pittsburgh Children's Museum. Mm -hmm. um, and those often involve bringing live animals and some, sometimes it's about my research. Sometimes it's just about facts about the animals. Um, and doing like a tabling display. So they'll have an event and I'll be there and I'll run the table and like introduce people to spiders. Um, I often, it's like themed. So we had, for example, like a Harry Potter night at the museum. And so they have a bunch of stuff that's like related to things you'd see in Harry Potter. And I had my spiders, but then I also had an activity about um, Aragog, the spider in the Harry Potter book <laughs> and how you can identify what family of spiders he belongs to based on the size and position of his eyes, oh. which is a technique that arachnologists use in the field. If I see a spider I've never seen before, I look at its eyes, and that actually tells me a hmm. lot about what type of spider it is. Um, and so doing things that kind of connect science to pop culture is always really helpful. Um, if you are a, like, um, bio uh, any sort of, like, field ecologist or biologist, a lot of areas will do things called the bio blitz so oh yes it's like uh, this event where you try to uh, catalog all the species of wildlife in your area and so i've done nature walks for those and identified spiders and things like that for the local one in pittsburgh that is unfortunately i miss i missed this year because i'm here in philadelphia but um and i've also done after school programs so there are um i worked with a, a non-profit in pittsburgh called Oh, gosh, what's it called? Um, oh, now I'm blanking on the name of it. 
Um, it's a nonprofit in Pittsburgh that, um, God, I, I'm like, I'm trying to come up with it. Anyway, the, what they do is they uh, do funding in, uh, they, they do funded programs in neighborhoods that are uh, um, for daycare, and it's a chance for kids to like have a fun educational experience. So I've done like uh, programs with them that are, sometimes they were about spiders, sometimes they were just about like our, like hum we did a whole series on like human senses. So we had like activities based on each different sense um, that, the, that the kids got to do and like try things hands on. Um, so that's, uh, I do a lot of stuff like that. I have recently got in a little bit into like blogging. So I um, did a, a little bit on my own personal website and now I'm running a blog called Arachnophiles. Hmm. Um, and it's all about arachnids and the scientists that study them. And so it's a bunch of arachnologists um, writing about the field. And so every month we do, for example, we just published our June edition of Arach News, which is all of the research and social media and like pop culture related to spiders that came out in the month of June. And so we do a roundup of that every month. We also write like longer stories about a, any one species or about a research paper. Um, and that's, it's been a busy, I haven't had as much time to work on it this summer, but that's another thing that I like to do. And that's another easy way that people can get involved is just writing for, um, either your own blog or there are a lot of different, um, really cool, um, digital publications that are open to submission from graduate students at any time. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. No, that sounds like a lot of uh, that sounds like a lot of stuff, and that's certainly a lot of things that scientists could get involved in. But it sounds like a lot of things that non scientists could also participate in. Because a lot of the things you're yeah. doing are really community events and outreaches. Mm -hmm. So that's really yeah. cool. And I think the idea that like the word scientist doesn't mean you have a graduate degree. Mm -hmm. I think the word scientist means to me, do you ask questions and answer them using the scientific scientific method um like and by that i mean you know you you make some observations ask a question think of possible explanations and try to figure out a way to test which explanation is the one that makes the most sense mm -hmm. um and i think a lot of people do that that wouldn't necessarily call themselves scientists yes but that's what a scientist is yes it's not whether or not you have a phd it's not whether or not you spent you know you have a lab I am not going to have a lab probably after I finish graduate school. I still am going to consider myself a scientist because that's how mm -hmm. I approach the mm -hmm. world. It's kind of like a way of thinking yeah. rather than like a stamp on your diploma or whatever. Yeah, I like that there's a, um, well, I would call him a scientist. Uh, I uh, saw who was not formally trained in mm -hmm. any science degree as far as I'm aware. Um, but he took a real fascination to uh, these migratory birds kind of yeah. off the coast of Alaska or somewhere near the Arctic mm -hmm. Circle. And so for a long time, he would basically just like vacation to this island and just count <laughs> the birds. And he really liked seeing them nest. Yeah. And he had been doing this for like 20 something years. That's and now it. he actually has, I mean, he has real university students that do come to him. So graduate yeah. students, postdoc students will come to him. Um, and he does a lot of collabs with other people. But it's funny, it's just this guy that had a weird hobby for birds <laughs> in cold climates on this island yeah. and um i would definitely consider him a scientist and in yeah. fact a lot of his work is being used and has been very helpful uh, for people yeah. studying this particular species so yeah I there's a lot of those some, i know some arachnologists that i would consider them arachnologists i would consider them spider scientists mm -hmm. they like that's not their day job um that's not, you know, like what they're trained in, but they have developed this fascination and they just started like cataloging species and things like that. And hey, you're doing science right mm -hmm. there. That's taxonomy. Mm -hmm. That's descriptive biology. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that is um, something and perhaps this could be a little segue into talking about the education, uh, mm -hmm. science education particularly. But I do feel um, that personally ecology um, and some of those natural sciences yeah. Um, seem to get a little bit uh, overshadowed, especially in <laughs> secondary education. Um, yeah, animals are cool when you're in second grade, but then they're not cool <laughs> when you're in 10th grade all of a sudden, um, at least it, it seems from kind of the subjects that we lean on. Do you have a similar experience? Um, absolutely. That is um, something that I'm 
I don't know. It's very frustrating. It, it is. A, it's. I mean, I feel it even in graduate school. So it doesn't go mm-hmm. away. There's there's like a split in our department between the ecology and evolution mm-hmm. labs and the molecular and cellular developmental biology. Basically, anything that has a connection to like human health or cellular function mm-hmm. is always valued, and they have more funding, and they have kind of different rules than us. Um, and that is an unfortunate thing that I mm-hmm. think is just everywhere in our society. Like the idea that does it matter to humans right now? Will yeah. it cure cancer? Um, yeah. For some people, is the end all be all. And to those people, I say a lot of those discoveries that ended up being antibiotics, mm-hmm. cancer treatments, medication for heart attacks, mm-hmm. actually came from someone being like, "Huh, I wonder like why spider venom works." Yeah. Like, it comes from just, like, someone being interested in an animal. Um, because animals, we, we humans have evolved once, and all the other animals are millions of them. Mm-hmm. And that means that they do lots of really weird different things, including things that we have not even thought of doing. Yes. Um, and we can, by appreciating their diversity, we can learn stuff that does help us, but we can also appreciate them for what they are. Um, yes. And, yeah, that, that's definitely something that I, like, struggle through like even i I said earlier um i thought i was going to be a veterinarian that's because everyone was like oh sebastian you like animals you should be a veterinarian Mm -hmm. um and i'm like yeah but like i don't really like i don't feel like i'm i don't want to be a doctor you know like that sort of environment isn't just like what i'm interested in i like more things than like just cats and dogs you know like but like that was the message that i constantly got and at some point i was like i guess i'm going to try to be a veterinarian but like I got one experience with it and it just like, yeah, I, I was right about myself that I didn't like this type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like that's a, a thing, a message that a lot of people get, like they show an interest in science and people are like, oh, you're going to be a doctor. And I'm like, doctors are doing great work. Doctors are doing so much work that I'm amazed they are awake at any point in their lives. But for some people, that's not what excites them. And we need those people too. And they like, even if you're not saving a person's life every minute of your day, mm-hmm. you're still con- you're still doing really interesting and valuable stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that's one thing I'm really excited about focusing on uh, this semester. Um, I'm going to be student teaching at a school where the administration is very excited and very supportive on in, in kind of introducing different avenues for science and science careers to students. And I'm really excited about ecology uh, fields in particular, because one of the things that I've really quickly learned going to wildlife conferences is that some of these guys, you know, who work for the GNR or, uh, you know, state or uh, federal fish and wildlife agencies or things like that, a lot of these guys are just like, and girls, um, are just people that like to go out and catch a fish and just yeah. hang out in the woods all day yeah. and that's their job and it's a nice job and it has benefits and yeah. i think a lot of kids don't realize that that that's a scientist and you can oh, do yeah. that you know you don't have to um <laughs> be doing rocket you science a, <laughs> right mm-hmm. yeah you don't have to be in a lab with a lab coat mm-hmm. like i've worn a lab coat as a joke more often than i've worn it for any need of it um <laughs> I don't do bench work. I don't know how to extract DNA. I don't know how to do to run a gel. Like these are things that other scientists do because they study that kind of stuff. But I study animal behavior, so like when it comes down to it, my science looks like I watch an animal and I see what it does in different situations. Mm-hmm. And like to me, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, to other people, they want to know like why are the cells inside that animal working? Different different questions, but like they're both valid. And yeah, there are people who are just like, I want to be in science because I want to go out in the field and like see what's happening in nature. And that's super cool. Like field biologists are awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so we've kind of kind of dabbled a little bit um, to your educational background. Um, So kind of more specifically, I guess. Uh, what was your relationship to science? I guess you could more summarize it growing up mm-hmm. in school specifically. Um, yeah. And was there a moment when you did have kind of a light bulb moment? I know you had a lot of phases of things that you were thinking mm-hmm. about doing, uh, but when was the kind of like, okay, yeah, I can do this. When did that finally come? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I, starting, I guess like the, when I was a kid, um, I, I like the main way I interacted with science and like nature was TV. So I watched Bill Nye. Mm. I watched Steve Irwin, who is still my hero. 
um, and I just one day hope to like be as cool as he is. Um, I watch documentaries on like Discovery, Planet, uh, or Nature. Uh, what is it? Uh, what was it called? Uh, Animal Planet. Mm. Um, all of these networks that like now just air reality TV trash one day in the distant <laughs> past. Yes. Um, actually showed like it, like really cool programming that like took you to different parts of the world and like you learn stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that like had like funding and you know better camera work and things like that. Um, I, I there were literally days where I would pretend to be sick stay home from school and just watch documentaries all day wow and like those are some of the best memories of my because i was just like like the physics talking all the stuff with like like space and like the 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 um the solar system i like i watched a ton of that and like that's what science was to me like i you know i had a you know i don't think i really had a science class in elementary um, not in middle school. I did in high school, and like my high school was really cool. It, it's like one of the better public high schools in New York City. Um, so I got a lot of cool science there. But up until that point, it was like basically TV. Mm. Um, and so I really am grateful that that was there. Um, and at the same time, I <laughs> all that time, I never really considered that I could become a scientist or that I would. Mm. Um, and part of that was because there was literally no one on any of those shows that looked anything like me. Mm. So you can't see me. Um, I am brown skin. I am ethnically ambiguous, but I am Colombian. <laughs> I feel you. Uh, so <laughs> literally no one can ever guess that. Like, I, it's, it's a game that I play every time I meet anyone because it's fun for me. <laughs> now it is. It used to be a point of, like, frustration, but now it's fun. Um, but, like, all the scientists I would see would be like, you know, white guys. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that okay, cool. That's like, you know, I thought it was really cool. Um, but the the idea that that was a career that could have been for me, uh, part of that went away because, like, it just wasn't in my head. Mm -hmm. Like, this is, again, that, like, subconscious stuff that your brain does to you. Um, if you don't see an example of something, it's much harder to decide to do that. Yeah. And it, that's just that's just how life your brain works um and so it wasn't until really like the second half of my undergrad career that i was like got more interested in animal behavior i took um it was a course on the biology of birds um okay. and it's run at the university of miami it was taught by a leading ornithologist his name is bill searcy um and that i think was one of the like moments that class was one of the, the moments that were like, I was like, oh, wait, like people are doing this. I'm like, they're not, you know, he had a graduate student. And I was like, oh, you know, like that's a, that's a thing that people do. Like you go out and, and in the class, we would go out and we would go bird watching. We would observe animals. We read research studies about like different types of behavior. Um, and I think that was for me, like where things started changing. I then took a, a, a class on animal behavior. Then I took a class on evolution. Like I a graduate, it was actually a graduate level class on evolution. Um, and that experience was like, all right, there's something here. Mm -hmm. But I still viewed it at the lens of like, there are cool animals here. I want to be where the cool animals are. <laughs> um, and that's how I kind of got into graduate school. It's always been about just like, awesome nature yeah just following the cool thing yeah that's yeah that's exactly when i was thinking i so i was at a nature center uh, volunteering i read eo whistlin's book and i looked at my husband i'm like you know if i go back to school which i'm not saying that i will i'm just gonna do whatever sounds really cool <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know that's that, what, yeah <laughs> that's what gets you through it it's like it graduate is. school is really challenging it is um it shouldn't be as challenging as it is and there's a lot of things people are doing to try to improve it mm -hmm. but for me i love spiders and like part of what gets me through things is like oh like cool yeah stuff. my spiders are really cool yeah. i want to learn more about them that's awesome that's awesome yeah um so uh continuing with science education what was your yeah. most positive science experience growing up so we we got a negative one um <laughs> chemistry we'll just pretend yeah, it doesn't yeah. exist <laughs> um but what was a positive experience that you've had that one's tough honestly because it, it, i can't 
at least right now, point to any like one day mm -hmm. that really changed things. Um, if I had to say anything, if I had to say anything that like set me on this path, it's um, Steve Irwin and his mm. show, The Crocodile Hunter. Oh, yeah. Um, this is for people who don't know, he passed away a couple of years ago, um, but he was a naturalist at, at, in Australia who was really interested in animal conservation. Uh, and the premise of his show is that he would go around to different areas in the world and like get up close and like often he would just pick up a an animal and like tell you how beautiful it is <laughs> yep. um, and this would be like a scorpion or a crocodile that he's currently wrestling or a um uh, like a venomous snake and the the idea that one just there's so many animals out there and they're all doing um vastly different things in their own way but two that like that you should appreciate all of them. Hmm. Like, whatever they are, however they look, they are beautiful in their own way, and we should respect them. And, like, even if he was picking the animal up, his number one priority was always the animal's safety and its comfort for as long as he had to hold it to either collect data or mm -hmm. to just show it to the camera. Um, and I think him and his work and his family's work, because it really turned into a family thing for for his wife and his kids. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I always go back to as like w who I want to be as a scientist, which is like, I'm not sure if everyone considers Steve Irwin a scientist. He did more conservation work than he did like academic research. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he's still my role model as, a, as someone who likes animals. We'll put yeah. it that way. I, no, I, I think uh, there's probably a lot of people out there who could say the exact same thing, that he's yeah. probably some of the reason uh, why they are where they are. So. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking constructively, what kind of classroom experience do you wish you maybe would have had in middle or high school? So yeah. uh, that might have made it easier um, to be where you are now. So if you knew that you were going to do this <laughs> way back the <laughs> when, what would you have liked your teacher to do to help you? get to that point uh, that's a good question okay i would have liked to one um meet local scientists in person which mm. is i know hard for a lot of teachers to do but there's a great program called skype a scientist mm -hmm. where you can get a scientist from any field that you want to do a um basically a skype class like they come in and they they just talk to your students for an hour or however long um to just to meet them so that they can meet a scientist, they can ask the scientist questions and like learn about who they are as a person, especially like a diverse group of scientists. Yes. Um, because again, like the idea that this is something that people from all sorts of backgrounds can do would have been really big for me. Um, I think the other thing would have just been like doing experiments and by experiments, I mean like real experiments, mm -hmm. not chemistry cooking lessons and not like memorizing facts in like AP bio class mm -hmm. um, but saying hey this is these are some things um, what kind of questions do you have about them all right let's pick one and let's follow it let's mm -hmm. let's go on that road and see where it takes us um, and that sort of being able to explore with it I think would have been really helpful to get an idea of what science is actually like, but to also just like kind of get more excited. Like I, I didn't like AP bio class that much and I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. It was just like memorizing like the Krebs cycle and like cell biology. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, and I wish I like, I think there are a lot of things that I'm doing now that I could have done then. Like I'm not doing a lot of, a lot of the stuff that I do behavioral stuff, especially and like observational research. Mm -hmm. You don't need many tools. You just kind of have to like get an animal. Yeah. Just go out and do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and think about it. And that sort of stuff would, I don't know. It would have really given me any appreciation of like what I need to do day to day and, um, how fun it can be. Awesome. Well, uh, uh, thank you for doing this. Yeah. It was a really awesome conversation. You yeah, really gave fun. me a lot. And if you I'm could, sorry, I know we went like super. I know long. it's okay. I'm okay I'm with terrible. it because that just means yeah. yay, <laughs> more stuff. <laughs> um, I love it. Um, and so, if you could close with some advice, uh, what advice would you give to a kid uh, who's listening right now and wondering about pursuing a similar path? 
Uh, maybe not the God. way you did it, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my... Do it better than me. Everyone out there, <laughs> I am here by chance. Do not trust chance. Chance will not, will not help you. Remember, think of the test where I failed. Chance is not help on your side. Um, so two things. One is um, ask questions. Go exploring. Mm -hmm. Like, go to your park. Find the local park. They're there. Walk around, and, like, you don't have to look like maybe there's not there's not many mammals there look for bugs because there's going to be a lot of them and they're going to be doing really weird cool stuff <laughs> um and they're going to be like they're going to be so different from me every one another you're going to see a lot of new stuff um keep asking questions about nature so like or about anything anything that interests you keep asking questions and follow that like Google searches and YouTube videos can actually take you pretty far. There's a lot of really great resources on social media platforms mm -hmm. like YouTube, like Twitter, um, to find answers to stuff that you're interested in. So there's like like PBS and things like that have programs where they create content for this. Um, me, like personally, uh, my advice is get a $15 macro lens for your cell phone. Ooh. Um, and you just go outside and see what you can find um, and you'll see two things one it's very easy to take really cool photos and videos of stuff that you never even thought of before like a flower up close um but you're and like the veins and leaves and how they're different in different plants and two um uh, you're gonna see so many more animals because you're gonna be seeing the little guys that are there mm. um and then you can actually photograph them and if you don't know what they are, guess what? There's an app called iNaturalist. You just upload that photo and people will try to figure out what it is. And now you're learning stuff and you're actually contributing to community science. So science is done by a bunch of different people in the area because you're rec you're making a record that this animal was here and people can use that to learn more about what species are where and why. Mm -hmm. So you're not only learning yourself, you're contributing to science and it's just a lot of fun, honestly. My other advice, just listen to podcasts. Podcasts are amazing. Oh, yes. Podcasts are like how I get in touch with the science world mm -hmm. because they take complicated things, they make them fun and interesting, yes. and you can get it driving on your commute when you're doing chores, mm -hmm. when you're walking to work. Like the the accessibility of it is wonderful, and you can learn so much. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I don't want to take any more of your time yeah oh hopefully there's lots of spider questions <laughs> yeah I, I also hope they haven't been yet but we'll see if you enjoyed this episode please subscribe and leave a positive review on my podcast through your favorite podcast viewing platform you can view the liner notes and find related resources on my website frizzlefactor.com there, I have a growing backlog of free and affordable lesson materials and links to my YouTube channel where I go more into the process of translating science into the classroom setting and helping teachers to modify ideas for their own classrooms. <laughs>